Howdy folks, this is Big Sam. Today we're going to talk about rifling and the different types used on these Russian Mosinagon rifles. Now, before we can get into that, we first have to talk about uh, what is rifling and the different types or different ways you can produce rifling. So rifling is, and we're, trust me, we're going to take a look, a closer look at this to give you a better idea, but rifling is basically introducing a twist into the barrel such that when you fire a projectile through that barrel, that rifling imparts a spin on the projectile. And we know, just like a football, when you spin it, it's going to make it more accurate. Now, rifling uh, kind of really started to come around in about the year 1500 is when we think it really was invented, I guess. And you might say, well, that's a long time ago. It is. It's, it's over 500 years ago. And we know that even in the first half of the 1800s, the 19th century, there's a lot of guns, a lot of muskets with no rifling even. So why for so long, even though rifling was around, did people not really use it in a lot of firearms, especially in military firearms? Well, one of the big issues with rifling came from black powder, and uh, we'll see this in one of the guns we'll take a look at here, but black powder can get into the grooves of the rifling, and it'll really gunk it up even after like 10 or 15 rounds you're going to have a lot of problems what that's going to do is all that gunk in the rifling is going to decrease your accuracy not what you want that's a bad deal especially for a military right so you got to clean it and then it's just a big mess so a lot of militaries for a long time um in their standard infantry rifles they were just smooth bore there was no rifling there's no there's no twisting or spinning of the projectile uh and that's just the way it was for a very long time uh, even in the revolutionary war there wasn't really a ton of rifling um there was some but you know and when you have these line infantries lining up shooting at each other well those were smooth bore muskets most of the time now one of the great things is when smokeless powder was invented when smokeless powder was invented, it made firing these projectiles a lot cleaner, okay? Which is absolutely fantastic when you want to have rifling on all of your guns. Now, by the time it was invented, people were really trying their best to have rifled um, firearms to the infantry, like the Gras rifle we're going to take a look at. Even though it was black powder, they were all rifled. By the 1860s and 1870s, pretty much everybody, uh, except maybe for the exception of Russia, with lar uh, as far as larger countries go, really was using rifling and almost everything they had by, let's say, the 1860s. Okay, that's a, that's a very, 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 very brief history of rifling. And we could have a whole series of videos, have a whole channel talking about rifling. But I'm going to try to make this as succinct as I can with the understanding that we kind of have to talk about a lot in order to really cover uh, rifling enough to give you an idea of what it is we're actually talking about here. Now, how do Mosins come into all this picture? Well, to understand that, we first have to understand the different types or different ways you can produce rifling. So these barrels uh, on any rifle you make it's going to start out in life as a barrel blank. So it'll be just a barrel, but it won't have any rifling in it. Think of it as just a, uh, you can think of it as a smoothbore, essentially, okay? And then what you have to do, once you have that, is you have to figure out a way to cut that spiral groove into the inside of that barrel, that smooth barrel. So how do you do that? Well, there's a couple ways, but... Really, for the first ooh, uh, at least probably 400 years of rifling, the way they produced it was uh, what's known as cut rifling. So what you'd have is you'd have think of this as the the barrel here. You would have a you would have this cutter, and you would have a blade on here, and it would you do a pass through 
uh, through the barrel and back, and you would cut one groove. But these Mosins uh, that you'll see later, they tend to have like four grooves. So you'd have to do a separate pass through and cut for each uh, groove, which is kind of a pain. One of the big problems with doing that is that if you it gives you a lot of potential for mess up. So let's say, you know, you cut a groove, you cut another one, then you cut another one, and you go to cut the last one, and oh, you mess up. Well, uh, the barrel's pretty much useless at that point, point. you have to start over. So that's a big no-no. Uh, it takes a lot of time, you have a lot of waste, and it costs a lot more, right? Because, well, time is money. The longer it takes to produce something, uh, the more expensive it is going to be due to labor and potentially other things, especially waste. So all that cost just adds up over time. But this is the way that rifling was produced for a very long time, okay? It cut rifling. If you hear that term, that's what it means. Now, I'm going to show you what some rifling looks like. And in order to do that, we're going to take a look at this French Gras rifle made in 1872. Now, at this point, some of y'all are probably wondering, Big Sam, this is a Mosin channel. Why are we looking at a French Gras that was made in 1872? That's a really good question. And there's two good answers that I have to that. And the first one is that surprisingly, this is one of the best examples of rifling that I could find, which is rather ironic because this gun's about 150 years old. Uh, it's in a lot better shape than I would be at 150, that's for sure. The other reason, though, is that this is an 11 millimeter Gras, which is a much larger caliber than, say, a Mosin Nagant, which is in 7.62 millimeter. What that allows us to do is it gives us a bigger diameter to look at. And the bigger the diameter, the easier it's going to be for us to take a look and see the distinguishing features of the rifling, I, a.k.a. the lands and the grooves. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at this rifle then. Now I'm going to zoom in a little bit and then I'm going to introduce a light source so you can see what it is I'm talking about a little bit better. All right. So we can see here, this right here is a land, or excuse me, a groove. I'm already confusing you. So this is cut, this is actually cut in here. And then we see here, these raised portions are gonna be the lands. So we have the groove, and then we have these two lands on both sides of the groove. And this particular rifle has four grooves, and has four lands. Now we can see that the crown is in actually really fantastic shape. But you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, most Mosin Nagants you'll find don't have uh, a crown nearly this nice. Uh, so which tells me this gun was pretty much never used, especially considering this is black powder. And we already talked about black powder, so it's very strange that this gun has as nice rifling as it does, but I'm glad because it helps me illustrate the point here. So we can see that these uh, grooves here were actually cut in France about 150 years ago. So they actually sent a, a cutter through this barrel to actually cut out individually each one of these grooves. And again, for each groove, you had to do a separate pass with the cutter. So... It, you can imagine this is a tremendously long process and it's very costly, especially when you mess up. Let's say you get three out of the four grooves cut, then you move on to the fourth one and then you make a mistake. Well, the eternity that you spent cutting the first three grooves perfectly it was, is now a total waste and you have to start over. So you can see that that would be extremely frustrating for old world gunsmiths. So there's got to be a better way than this. And thankfully, there is. In the 19th, or excuse me, the 20th century, we'd have a new method of producing rifling. It would come around, and it's called 
button rifling. Button rifling. Um, button rifling, as it's called, it, the way that's produced is well, it's with a, it's what's called a button. But it's it's you might think of the thing on your shirt that you know you button when you put it on in the morning. That's not what we're talking about here. This button, you can kind of think of it as uh, the shape of a bullet, more or less. Okay, so you can kind of think of it as like this guy right here. All right, so. Think of, think of something that looks relatively like this, but it has the reverse pattern of the rifling. What does that mean? Well, if you want to cut grooves in the barrel to produce the rifling, you're going to have to have a raised section that mimics that pattern, a spiral pattern, potentially. And it would be on the button like that. Now, the button would be made of like a tungsten, a tungsten alloy, probably, something really really hard and you want that because the way button rifling is produced is you take that button and you just force it through that smooth bore barrel and what it's going to do is because it's uh, a lot harder than the steel in the barrel it's actually going to displace that metal so instead of cutting it you're sort of using a uh, force to just sort of press out that pattern in the rifling now, what's nice about doing that? Well, for one thing, you don't have to do a separate pass for each groove. Um, so it's a lot faster. You're going to have less waste, less waste using a button to produce rifling, which is also fantastic. And you're going to be able to make maybe 10 times as many barrels as you could before. Let's say, just as an example, um, maybe you could make 10, 10 barrels or rifle barrels in the time it would take to produce one rifle barrel using a, a cutting technique, okay? So there is a lot of incentives for using button rifling that we know now, but around World War II for the Soviets, um, it wasn't so black and white. It wasn't so clear cut, excuse the pun. So what type of rifling do Mosins have now that we got that whole mess out of the way? Well, for almost the first probably 40 years of the Mosin Nagant, the rifling was cut with that old world cutting process. You'd have a cutter and you'd have a lot of waste. But one of the nice things about that is they were able to salvage some of that waste. But how were they able to do that? Well, let me give you a, a hypothetical scenario of something that could happen when you're doing a cutting technique. So let's say I'm um, currently going to cut the second groove. All right, so let's say I've cut the first one. I'm going to now cut the second one with my cutter through the barrel. Well, let's say halfway through the barrel, uh, I sneeze, uh, right? Someone pranked me and came up with a big turkey feather and waved it in front of my nose and I sneezed, okay? Now, one, if I sneeze and I mess up that barrel, I'm probably going to go to the gulag, which would be bad. But the other issue, and a much bigger issue, is that now that whole barrel has been wasted, and it's probably going to come out of my pay, uh, which eh, back in those days probably meant you weren't eating for a while, unfortunately. <laughs> um, whatever the case, though, it was bad. So one of the ways they were able to salvage that was with this. Now, you might ask, Big Sam, what does a Nagant revolver have to do with this? Well, here's why. Think about this. If I messed up the first half of the barrel, the front half of this Mosin Nagant barrel is still going to be salvageable. So I can chop off the bad part, and I can still take that remaining bit and turn it into a Nagant barrel. Because, remember... Even if that rifling's partially been cut, it's okay because a Nagant is also in 7.62 caliber. See? Look at that. It's, it uses the same diameter projectile. And so, in fact, a lot of Nagant barrels were probably produced from Mosin Nagant, or things that were supposed to be Mosin Nagant barrels, but somebody, uh, somebody goofed, somebody had an oops a daisy and did a bad thing. And thus, 
Someone, though, had a good idea and probably redeemed themselves from the gulag and said, well, let's just take that, what we would normally would have thrown away, and make a Nagant barrel out of it. And then they also did this with the Tokarev as well, because the Tokarev in 762 Tokarev, again, 762, the same caliber as this bad boy right here. So that's kind of interesting. So that's the way that kind of it was as the life of a factory, a Soviet factory worker, or even an Imperial Russian factory worker before that, from 1891 when we started producing these rifles up until the 1930s. Now, in the 1930s, uh, they started to take a look at the idea of button rifling. And this is something we don't have a ton of knowledge yet. Our good friend over in Russia, Alexander Yushchenko, who does a lot of the research... Uh, for the Mosin Nagant 9130 rifle, and where we get most of our info from. I'll have a link to his website if you want to go there. He has a lot of good information on these rifles, but one of the things he's been able to discover is that around in the late 1930s, um, the Soviets finally realized there's got to be a better way. And part of this may have come in the wake of some of the other uh, production simplifications that we've taken a look at here on this channel, for the 9130 rifle, including this magazine going from uh, riveting to, well, welding, and really crudely spot welding, as you can kind of see remnants of throughout uh, this old magazine here, and, and grinding thereafter, right? So that was one of the things. Another thing was the bolt handle. If you're interested in learning more about some of those simplifications made, um, we have a lot of videos on that, so go check those out. But for the sake of this uh, video, just know that in the 1930s, around 1935, 1936, we would see some interesting simplifications made. As far as we can tell, maybe a couple years later, around 1938, it seems that the Izhevs factory decided to start producing in small quantities uh, rifles that had rifling produced with a button around 1938. And this gets a little weird because it seems like it was mostly the Izhevs factory, but maybe the Tula factory did it too before uh, World War II would start. It's it's not really clear. Um, it's still something we're trying to figure out, but the, the Soviets, the moral, is, the moral of the story here is that the Soviets started to try it out in the late 1930s. And they would continue to produce it side by side with the standard cut rifling. Now it seems that most of the rifles in the 1930s were still produced with cut rifling, but there were definitely some produced with button rifling. Now this gets a little interesting though, because by the time we get to 1941, and I'm not currently clear if this was before or after the June 22nd date at the start of Bar uh, Operation Barbarossa, when the Nazis invaded, the Soviets would actually s start producing a significant number of these M38 carbines using button rifling in 1941. All right. Now, how can we tell if, let's say, your Mosin has button rifling or cut rifling? That's a good question. And there, we're not 100% sure right now, but as far as we can tell, what we th here's what we currently think. Um, a lot of these rifles, especially the M38s from 1941, it seems like, will have this weird marking. It'll look like a T in an oval, uh, or a T in a circle, maybe. It's this guy right here. Let me get my uh, poking device here. So this is what looks like a, t a badly stamped T right there within like a circle or an oval or a tombstone or something. It's inside some kind of a shape here. Some circular-ish kind of a shape. What we think is that this marking means that the rifling was produced using a button. So this rifle almost certainly has button rifling. And that's pretty interesting. Okay, so here we have a Mosin Nagant 9130 PU Sniper. 
This one was produced by the Izhevsk factory in 1944. And this is one of those weird uh, Yugoslavian partisan guns that we looked at in another video. What's strange here is this has really nice rifling, probably the nicest rifling of any uh, Russian non-Finnish Mosin Nagant that I've ever seen. So it's really nice to have this on hand so I can actually show you what proper rifling looks like on a Mosin. It's almost comical, actually, how hard it is to find a 9130 with a brand new crown. Um, those things just, they got used, guys. That's all I can say. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a light source, and we're going to zoom in here a little bit on the muzzle so we can get a better look at what's going on here. And let me get my pointer. All right, so we can see right here is a groove right here. We can see we've got this little section here, and this, this is raised, so this is one of the lands, and then this is another land right here. And we can see remnants of the old copper jackets right here. Now, we didn't see that on our Gra, and one of the reasons, because it was very clean and hasn't really been shot, one of the other reasons is because, um, well, those didn't use jacketed bullets because they weren't, jacketed bullets weren't really invented in 1872 yet. We can see we have a very distinctive crown here and this really nice, beautiful rifling. This gun's pretty much brand new, so if you have a Mosin Nagant, this is what it would have looked like when it was brand new. Close enough. I mean, this has been shot, but not really compared to m most of them I've seen. But this one was almost certainly cut. When I say cut, it wasn't cut, the rifling here. This was actually um, pressed out using a button, almost certainly. Um, by 1944, especially on PU snipers, I would say a 99% chance that this rifling was produced using a, uh, a tungsten or a tungsten alloy button that was pressed through the barrel. And again, you can press it either way. You can press it down or press it back up. Um, but what's nice about that button is it's going to give you, uh, it's going to make these all uniform. And what's really nice about that, especially on something like a PU sniper rifle, is that um, it's really going to lend itself better to accuracy, but also consistent accuracy across an entire production batch. Let's say, you know, I want to produce 100 rifles. Well, if I cut each one of the rifling individually, you know, I can, I can, I can you know, really be careful, and, and they were, about the tolerances of the barrel blank itself to make sure that, let's say you had 100 that you were producing in a production run. Well, you can do your best to make sure that all 100 barrel blanks are all very closely um, within the same amount of tolerances. Like just, they're almost identical barrel blanks. But if you cut them, if you cut the rifling, you can have wildly different results potentially um, in the accuracy, in the, in the twist. It, 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 there's all sorts of weird things that can happen when you do, uh, when you cut the rifling, right? And you can mess it up. I mean... It, there could be inconsistencies potentially across all of those hundred guns, but if you if you press out this rifling with a button, you can use that same button across all one hundred rifles. And what's that's what that's going to do for you is it's going to give you consistent accuracy. The accuracy, or now the barrel blanks, not only the barrel blanks but the rifling of each of those hundred rifles is now going to be very, very close. Far more close than you'd ever get with, say, uh, just your standard old old world cutting process. Uh, so that's what we have here. This was almost certainly produced with button, with a button, and that's pretty interesting. Now, they why would they want to mark this? Well, one of the reasons is because 
Button rifling was still not really that well known. And it's kind of funny that even though they switched over to the carbine production um, to have mostly button rifling, they didn't really know, as far as we can tell, exactly how the performance would be. Um, so they didn't know necessarily know what the accuracy would be like uh, over time, and how it would degrade. Now they had a, they could do initial accuracy tests, right, to say, well, we we produced it and we shot it and. Well, it, it meets the accuracy standards, right? I mean, there, if it didn't meet the accuracy standards at production, they weren't going to make a bunch of these, right? And they weren't that dumb. It costs a lot of money to produce one of these. Uh, so they were accurate enough, but what they didn't really understand was how this would hold up in, say, uh, a year or two years or five years of hard or consistent use. Um, how, how would the button rifling wear in comparison to cut rifling? They didn't really know that. Now, one of the nice things is if you mark it, what you can do is say, all right, in 1941, we're going to produce X amount of rifles with cut or button rifling. And the button riflings will have this marking. And then you can come back in, say, three or five years and take whatever rifles you still have in use from that this sample and then conduct some accuracy trials again to say, okay, let's examine how much these have degraded. Now you can do this uh, with visual inspection, and you can also do this with actual, uh, you know, accuracy testing. Let's shoot at a paper target at 200 yards and see what kind of results we can get. But it does appear that as time went on, they realized that even probably only after a couple years that. These pr had pretty good longevity and wear patterns. Uh, and so we would see the Jez factory start to produce uh, rifling with button rifling uh, more and more and more. And it, what it seems like is by 1943, they almost stopped entirely marking with this T in a circle marking. And what we think that means is that by that time, they realized that okay, we're just going to make everything button rifling. We don't really care. We don't need to mark this anymore. We have good results. Let's just do it. Uh, and again, there's another incentive to do this. Why? Well, in 1941, in the second half, the Soviets lost over 5 million rifles uh, at the hands of the Nazis. Now, that's a ton of rifles that you have to replace, and you have to replace quickly. So how did they do that? Well, one of the ways they were able to achieve that, probably, is by switching from cut rifling to button rifling. Uh, button rifling is so much faster to produce, and this makes a ton of sense because the rifling in the barrel is one of the most treacherous and costly and difficult tasks uh, in the entire production of the rifle. The barrel is really the heart and soul of the production, and that's where a lot of the time, the money, the energy, the resources go. And so if you're able to speed this up, what you're able to do is make a lot more rifles, and you're going to be able to do it quick, quicker and cheaper. So it's a win-win-win, because um, I would take a gander to say that generally speaking, the rifles produced with button rifling were probably a little bit more accurate over a, a, like a very, if you look at a very broad sample size of button rifling compared to the cut rifling of Mosin Nagants, uh, you're going to have cut, you're going to have some that have cut rifling that are more accurate, probably. But as a whole, again, this, the button rifling is going to give you more consistency. So it's likely that these are either at least more accurate or at least more consistent. You had less deviation in the production process. And having less deviation is also going to benefit you because um, the less deviation you have, the higher probability that this rifling that you built is going to meet the specified tolerances of production. <sighs> okay, so that was a lot to get through. But... This is probably how to tell if your rifle has button rifling. And the marking, again, it seems like it can be very different. Uh, 
and it seems like it's going to be mostly on Ijevsk rifles produced uh, in the early 1940s, probably around 1941 to 1943. If you have something that looks like that and you're, you're not exactly sure, um, check out uh, Alexander Yushchenko's website because he's got some interesting pictures that shows a pretty good variety of some different uh, markings. And it's weird that the markings seem to be kind of inconsistent. Now, not necessarily in placement. Um, that's, that's not really anything new for the Mos and the Gun, especially for refurbishment marks or things like that. But the actual stamping itself seems to deviate. So I'm not exactly sure what's with that. This is still something that's being uh, uh, steadied by him. But we, there's a high probability enough for me to go out on a limb and say, yeah, this is probably a button, a button rifling marking. Now, there's one other interesting factor here we need to talk about today. Because as a lot of y'all know by now who watch the channel, the Tula factory uh, stopped 9130 production altogether in 1940. And then in 1941, they had to shut down the factory and move it across the Urals. And it was sort of a bad year for the Tula factory. Um, but they were able to reopen in 1942, and they started to produce rifles again. So when they did that, this gets a little strange. Uh, so let's take a look at a Tula rifle, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about here. So here we have, oh boy, a Tula produced 9130 rifle. And this particular rifle was produced in 1942 after they had reopened. And what type of rifling do you think this has? Uh, I'll give you a minute. All right. This actually has cut rifling, which is interesting. And it's, it's doubly interesting because another little known fact, after the Tula factory reopened in 1942, from 1942 to 1944 when they stopped production, they received their barrel blanks at least a large portion, if not all, from the Ijevsk factory. So the Ijevs produced this barrel blank here, and then they'd send it over to the Tula factory, and the Tula factory would finish it, and they would cut the rifling at the Tula factory. Well, the Tula factory, they had a, they had a really hard time getting good equipment, and they were probably stuck with some old stuff that they were able to scrounge up, and one of the things, I guess, was one of those old rifle cutting uh, tools or a, a whole set of those. And so that's just what they used. Another thing could be actual uh, just factory worker experience. It could be they weren't able to find anyone, even if they had a button to produce rifling, that knew how to do it correctly. So maybe they only were able to find some old world gunsmiths that, that knew the old style cutting process. And so that's what they did. Now, it wasn't such a big deal that they did the cut rifling because, again, the Tula factory produced an order of magnitude less rifles during the war than the Ijez factory would. So they really were able to still get by with the old cut rifling. Now, does that mean these rifles were less accurate? I'm not going to say that because, again, what we know is cut rifling uh, has a has a or excuse me button rifling has a higher has a greater potential for accuracy or intrinsic accuracy than cut rifling that's a very broad statement and remember these guys still even in wartime contrary to maybe what a lot of people think these still had accuracy standards they had to meet every single rifle had to meet accuracy standards uh, and so again this kind of goes back to the deviation while the cut rifling like this guy has, may deviate a little bit more from rifle to rifle than, say, the button rifling, this guy still had good enough accuracy to become a sniper rifle. So it just because this has cut rifling and not button rifling does not in any way mean it's inaccurate. What it does mean is it, it was a pain to produce and it took a lot longer. That's really what I'm saying. And there's a higher potential for something to go wrong. Thankfully, it didn't here. And we have this really nice rifle to show you now. 
So that's kind of the overview of different types of rifling for the Mosin Nagant rifle. And it's always great when we get to have a, a, a Nagant revolver to kind of show as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video of all this rambling about rifling. Um, if you made it this far, big kudos. Thanks for watching. Please let me know if y'all have any prayer requests. If you have any Mosin Nagant questions or prayer requests or really anything, never feel bad or never hesitate to send me an email. I'd love to hear from y'all. Until next time, guys.